Okay, hello everyone. Let's get going. Um, I think we were discussing a couple, three options of the competitions. I saw Steve and Rekel already make the submissions, and I checked a little bit uh, at least to get an understanding of what uh, the competition is about. Um, and I'm talking about the October so we're trading at the close uh, prediction um, competition. I think uh, that one seems interesting, uh, although there's a lot of uh, startup terminology hurdles that you would need to go through that I'm just uh, about uh, getting on top of right now. Um, if people are okay with it, we'll probably choose to do that competition on the side. I also want to try doing, I think, um, the uh, prompting thing just out of interest in LLM, but that again ends in like a week or two weeks. So people are still interested. We can discuss that, but we can focus on the October competition if people are motivated to do that. Any comments, Steve, from uh, what you have tried? I saw that you made some submissions at front. Yeah, like um, the competition seems very similar to that one we did last year. Um, his name I can't remember. <laughs> um, the other prediction one that we did last year. Yeah, there was. Uh, was it run by the same guys? Of they were also, or I don't recall. They were like one which was done by some Japanese company. I remember that. Um, um, there were two of them in uh, back to back. Yeah, sorry. It was the, yeah, so like we did one that was like a nightmare. It was like you just like spent all your time jigging data about. The one that was okay was the Ubiquant market prediction. Oh, if that's you, right. If you, if, you, yeah. if you remember it, it was like they gave you like tables with like 300 features or something. So it was very similar to this in that you didn't know what the features were. All you knew that there were features of stocks and you had to try and predict uh, the prices. Um, so this one here is very similar, except there's far fewer things. So like it's just sort of predicting the end of day on the NASDAQ stock exchange um, for, for 200 different stocks. And yeah, so it's like the last, what is it? The last two hours of trading, or something, or the last half minutes. hour or something. Ten, was, yeah, um, ten minutes or five, uh, like um, you know, from what, and that's where I was saying the one thing, um, just for people uh, getting started, um, there are a few notebooks that at least I felt were useful in getting familiar with the concepts because even the concept, I mean, just the terminology, it's not once you dive into it, it's not that complicated, but it's just a lot of terms to be understand and how they work uh, and so on. Uh, you know, there is all different um, terminology that's uh, related to it. Um, so I can share my screen on at least. Uh, so uh, before we go there, though, any comments or thoughts? Are people okay with uh, choosing this competition and diving into it? Any uh, comments? I think uh, Steve is already actively making submissions. I just started, wanted to get a lay of the land. Uh, but uh, in the mind, Terence, any thoughts, comments? No, no, that, that works for me. Thank you. Yeah, it works for me too. Yeah, sounds good. Okay, uh, okay, let me share my screen and then, you know, once I'm done, uh, we can get a little more advanced uh, yes. input. Although uh, there is like a lot the... of terminology, um, I don't think that you really need to, to know what the terminology is. Like in some ways you can sort of treat it like the other one where it's just like a load of numerical fields or whatever. So yeah, like obviously there's a few sort of good EDAs that explain it all if you want to go into depth into what each field actually means and what they're on about. But at the same time, if you just want to try and predict the target 
you can just treat it as numbers going into your model and let the model deal with it, I think. Yeah, no, that's true as well. So <laughs> I haven't tried any submissions. I just wanted to point to a few notebooks that I found useful, um, at least in what we're trying to do. One is this uh, trading at the close intro, which is by the optical guys themselves. And uh, they kind of, uh, this I felt was a really good notebook illustrating what it is that we are trying to do in the terms like what is the order book that is the orders that go during normal market hours and then what's the auction order thing and how the uh, and again they use all this language as he was saying I mean you don't need to know that but at least you know in order for Need to get a grasp of what it is that we are even trying to do. We are trying to kind of uh, predict uh, targets and what those are. We we'll learn, but um, yeah, the bid is the buying price that anybody wants to buy. The this is the price. These are the number of um, buy offers, if you will, and these are the number of sell offers. Um, and the order book is just what happens during the day. I mean, you just place orders of, oh, at this price, I want to sell eight shares at the price of nine, sell one share at the price of 10, no buyers yet in the market. The auction is something, and you can read it, it's about something that happens at the last 10 minutes of apparently the um, market and then what we are trying to predict, if I recall correctly, uh, is just the target value of the stock at the end of the market. Is that right, Steve? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. And at, I think if, and this was one question I had, Steve. Is it um, like six? Um, because we are predicting over the last 10 minute period. Um, which and 10 minutes and obviously each minute has 60 seconds. So we will, you'll see the plot, which has 600 seconds, um, the max seconds in a bucket, uh, which we'll get to in a minute. Uh, are we predicting 10 predictions for each stock? Do you know? Um, I, I'm not sure. I thought it was just the closing price, but closing I, price. I'm not, oh, okay. I'm not a hungry. I'm not a hundred percent sure. Okay. Sorry, it's maybe it's maybe like okay. at each um, bucket time, is it? Yeah, that's what I was thinking. That maybe you know uh, at each bucket so for each, and there are multiple stocks that uh, they talk about, and we'll get to that in a minute. And um, so, order book is just what happens during the day, and then in the auction is what happens in the last ten minutes. And you can place orders to just do that in the last ten minutes, and then there is. Uh, what you're trying to predict is the ending price of the stock. And the way the ending price is determined is what is illustrated in this notebook. Again, you see the buy orders and the sell orders. And in the auction book, uh, the difference is you have to clear or the way they have used an algorithm to clear the uh, or match. And matching basically means that you kind of Choose a price, and then you figure out how many buy orders and how many sell orders are there. And the little bit of an interesting thing, obviously, is you know if you have a price of nine, then anybody who's trying to uh, sell would, you know, even though there are four sell orders at eight uh, and only two at nine, uh, you will think of this as six sell orders at nine because obviously if you're a seller, you don't mind selling at a higher price. And similarly, if you're a buyer, you don't mean you don't mind buying at a lower price. So that's the reason you see, uh, as this is discussed, at a price of 10, there's no matching. At a price of nine, um, the, even though there are three bits greater than nine, which is, you know, you can see that three buyers are waiting to buy at nine. And um, there are six uh, sellers who are willing to sell at nine or lower. And that's why there is the six here because you can add these two numbers. So that's a little bit of something that you can kind of uh, through and it's fairly self-explanatory once you go through that. And then the imbalance uh, and at a price of eight, there'd be four because you're, you know, four guys, four buying, four selling, but there are uh, 
the point here is that there are seven buyers uh, because obviously if you're selling at eight and if you're willing to, if these three buyers are willing to buy at nine, then they will also be willing to buy at eight. So you have seven buyers willing to buy at eight and four willing to buy uh, sell at uh, eight. So, uh, so then you would match four lots and because higher lots are matched at a price of eight, eight would be the closing price. So that's how the whole thing works. And the imbalance is three on the buy side. And you can think, I mean, in fact, they show that in the rest of the notebook, but this is a signal. If you have a buy imbalance, then they have a plus one or minus one, whichever direction you'll see later. But that indicates that there is a desire for the price to go higher, right? Because there are more buyers willing to buy at um, when there's a buy imbalance at eight, which means that the buyers are willing, there are more buyers in the market than sellers at eight, which would tend to indicate that you would probably uh, see uh, better than eight uh, ending stuff. And then the combined book is just combining the order book and the auction book. And then related to that, there are some, this is all the different thing, um, you know, and uh, the terms called the near price and the far price. Uh, otherwise, the rest of it is fairly self-explanatory. And then there is a weighted average price, which is somewhat of a normalized, if you will, value between the um, buying price and the selling price. So bid is buy and ask is sell. Think of it that way. So that's what you get. And then what we are predicting is the 60 seconds. Um, this is why I was thinking, um, Steve, that there would be, you know, the 60 second future move in the wrap of the stock. Um, and whatever number of stocks there are, you have to predict the 60 second future move. And if it's 60 seconds, then it would be either 60 data points, or if you think you're predicting at every minute, then you're predicting. Um, uh, blah, blah, blah. Yes, if you look at um, if you look at the actual data, yeah, like yeah, so if like for each yeah. stock on each day, it has like the last period of the day divided up into buckets, so you can see the right. seconds in the bucket, um, and yeah, like the seconds in the bucket, I think it's every ten seconds, I think that's what it is. So, it is, it's so it'll give you seconds, right. Yes, yeah, so. That would mean it would be 10, 600 seconds is uh, 10 minutes, correct? Yeah. So it gives you the data every 10 seconds, I think. So like each bucket is 10 seconds, I think. So if if you were like able to see the the next, yeah, so you can see here, like this is the stock ID zero going down. It goes down to 199. There's 200 in stocks um, and the seconds in bucket. Yeah, so it's like divided for each stock, the last, whatever we said, 10 minutes is divided up into these buckets. And so um, effectively, you're wanting to predict what the target price is going to be six buckets ahead. Ah, so like, six buckets. So that's what I was thinking. Yeah. So, oh, six buckets. So it's over uh, 10 seconds because you're predicting over 60 seconds is the requirement. That's right, yeah. So that so, means if you have 10 seconds, then you'll have uh, uh, six predictions. Okay. Yeah, so, so for, for each... each stock, six predictions. Yeah, so like for the first stock there, you've got like the stock zero at, at that time zero and bucket zero. Yeah, so that row there. So at the end of that row, there'd be a, um, a WAP price. Yes, yeah, so you can see the WAP value there. And the target there, so that's what you're trying to predict, the target. And like that target is related to six buckets into the future ah, okay. for that stock. So you want this target for this stock six steps forward. Yeah, so like that's the target from the from the last stock. Yeah, so like that target value there is obviously they've given you that in the training data, but it is related to six 
bucket steps into the future for that stock? And it's this target is actually normalized to some index. Yeah. And um, then this is what converts it in from basis points. I think this 10,000 is somewhat related to the basis points, right? Yeah. So if you were to take that the stock price at bucket number zero and the stock at, and divide the stock price at bucket number six by bucket number zero, that would give you the value on the left. And then the the index WAP thing is like um something yeah, like their their measure or whatever just to normalize things. And as you say, like and then they multiply by ten thousand just to get it into it whichever units they're using. But yeah, so as I say, you, you don't really need to know these things. It's just you can like just feed all the numbers into your into your model and just get it to try and predict the target. But six predictions for each stock. So you would need to uh, so as we discussed in prior tabular things, one of the things to think through is once you predict the first step, then you want a model which includes potentially that first step into the all the other use the first steps output along with all the other data to predict the second step and once you do that then and there are some models which don't do that right they predict all six at the same time correct Steve? if i recall from our previous tabular related stuff yeah and this competition is exactly the same as that other one in that when you're predicting, you're predicting in a loop. They've got like an API, so you predict for the for the 200 stocks at the at the time period. You predict the target values then, and once you've predicted those, then the loop will give you the next set of um, data test data to predict on, and it'll also show you the target values from the previous step. So you can use those in your model. You can use like the targets that have gone before to try and predict the next ones. Ah, so it once you predict the first step, what you're saying is it will reveal to you the actual target result from the first step, and you can use that along with all the other data to then predict your second step. And once you predicted the second step, it will reveal the second step actuals. Um, That's right. And you yep. can go that way. Right. But you can only do that, and this is the submission API related uh, kind of That's information right, yeah. about how to. Yeah, so like that, that notebook there shows you the loop in, in operation. So it shows you like the information that it gives you at each step. So yeah, just down a little bit more. Yeah, so here, this is the loop there, that for loop. Yep, there. Yeah, so at each step of this for loop, the, the test value there, it contains um, the 200 stock, the information for the 200 stocks, like all that stuff that you showed before about bid price and whatever it was, forward price and all that. Mm -hmm. um, the revealed revealed targets one it is the targets from the previous step and then the sample oh, prediction okay. it's just it's the thing that you have to fill in with your prediction for the 200 stocks yes for the current uh, for the predicted next step yeah so as soon so you can see like at the bottom of the loop there it says env dot predict and then you give it the sample prediction so once you've that's you submitting your prediction for that time step. And once you've predicted your, once, once you've made that prediction in the next loop, then on once you've done that, it'll free up the thing and let you get the next step of data. Ah, and what does this do? Sample prediction target is zero. Well, that's their prediction. They're predicting that the target is going to ah, be zero. Okay, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because, they yeah, just here, said that, you know, yeah. yeah. Yeah, they're just setting it to like zero because they don't have a model to do the prediction. Once, once you've yeah. got a model, you would set the target value to whatever your model predicts it's going to be. Predicts. 
yeah yeah in fact i think why zero is kind of explained here when they say in this example they just say oh you know it's quite often that a baseline uh, you can just predict zero and that's pretty good because we don't know much in talk uh, it's it's quite hard to beat the baseline and that's why they kind of use a baseline prediction of zero which we and then yeah. they say well you can kind of beat the baseline because you can base a prediction on this imbalance thingy which is um if that is a by imbalance and make it a one if it's a, or whatever just ma- use the mapping and based on that we can kind of improve on the baseline and you can see how small of an improvement it is because you get 6.4077 and this 6.4070 so you get a basis point of 0.0007 which is the reason that you multiply this by whatever the 10000 number that you see uh here up here that us showing you and that's what converts it to instead of dealing with this you know, incredible decimal small fractions you can kind of get nice round um numbers that's why but you can see you know tiny fraction but those fractions still makes millions in the stock market so that's what i was i didn't gone through this yet but so that and then you can predict targets use them box that's why this 200 pools then you, this is it this means the first step and so you can go through six steps is that the idea um We can go through more than that, but yeah, if you went back to that one a sec, um, yeah. So here, yes, yeah, so the number on the left hand side there, the row ID. So what that means is, the first number is the date, so that's date four hundred and seventy eight. Then the second number is the bucket, so like this is the 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 second step for the stock, and then there's yeah, as you say, there's two hundred of them because there's two hundred stocks. So this is the the second target prediction on that day for each stock and then the last sample prediction down below there the if you just scroll down a sec yeah so like this it only goes up to 540 like it's the last bucket time um yeah so like although it's like the last um 600 seconds or whatever the the final minute is missing ah okay so it's 540 because it's uh, like you said um uh, it's 600 seconds but because it's 10 minutes but it goes from zero so it's 9 minutes or it just yeah. doesn't have the 10 minute of it well you're trying to predict 1 minute into the future so this is the last prediction you can make is like at 540 seconds cuz like the last Uh, the last reading on the the stock market is at 600 so it's 1 uh-huh. minute in the future from 540 so you predict um from yeah so like it's 40 to 600 every 10 seconds so so this day on day 480 here um at time bucket time 540 you're making a prediction and your prediction is what the target value is going to be at 600 mm. which is 60 seconds ahead of that that set of data so you get that set of data with all the, the stock um values all all of the information about the stock and you're predicting what in this case here is the final closing price of the stock exchange on that day and but then and you just predicting just oh this is the final prediction so like yeah, that yeah. you would have uh you know like 
Um, yeah, so that one there that you're on, at, at this one here, so like at this bucket time 10, you're effectively, you're predicting what the, what the um, target value is going to be at 70, because you're predicting second, 60 seconds into the future. So at this time, at bucket time 10, they give you the information like about all the trades that have happened at bucket time 10. And then they want you to predict what the target value is going to be 60 seconds in the future, which would be bucket time 70. Ah, uh, okay. So it means that each time you're predicting a minute into the future. Exactly. Yeah. Can you do that? Can you do that? Um, or six minutes, then, if you're doing six predictions? No, you're doing more than six predictions. You're doing, yeah, so, like, there's 600, you're predicting on the last 600 seconds of the day, and, like, divided up into 10-second buckets. So, but, like, so the last 60 seconds, there's no data because of the fact that when you get to 540, 60 seconds in the future is the end. So you're predicting 540, sorry, 54 or 55 predictions for each day. So, so here. Oh, okay. That's what I was, uh, okay, okay. So you're actually predicting 54 predictions for each stock. Exactly, yeah. For each day. Per day. Uh, so that's like 200 stocks times 54 predictions per stock. Because the 54 predictions come from, you're predicting uh, 60 seconds out, which is a minute out, for nine minutes. Yes. That makes sense. Okay. That's what I was just about or didn't... Uh, Okay, got it. So you predict, obviously, you start 10, 20, and you go on to 55, 40. That's right, yeah. That's uh, right, 10, and then 60. And in 60 seconds, steps starting from 10, going up to 540. Well, actually, you start at zero. There's one above ah, that. okay. Up to 540. Yeah, so... Yeah, so that's the, that's the first bucket on the day. So there you're predicting one minute ahead. So you'd be predicting 60 seconds after that data. Yeah. yeah. And then every minute further until the ninth minute. Yes. In the ninth minute, you're predicting kind of the closing size. That's right, yeah. And the cool thing about it, and this happened, or this is the way these competitions work, which is uh, kind of interesting, is they take your model. Um, once we submit, we don't get a rank right away. Uh, they take our models and they run it. I don't know the frequency with which they're going to do it in this competition, but they run it every week or every month or something over a period of like three to six months and check our model over that period and then produce the results of the competition or publish the results of the competition at the end of that period. And they give you an update as you go, as time progresses. So in effect, what they do is they apply your model in the real world and check how it does. So that's similar for this competition too, right, Steve, from what little I saw? Yeah, that's right, yeah. I'm not sure how much into the future it goes on. I, I didn't like yeah. it there. Oh, yes, yeah, so it goes for three then... months. Months, yeah. Periodic, uh, periodic update to the leaderboard. Uh, every two weeks, they publish an update. So, 
you know, it's kind of interesting because these things are interesting because they use the submitted models and you don't get a score right away until March 20th, to, from December 20th. So you use all the data that they have right now and then you use the API because they don't want you to use the data. As Steve was saying, if you predict the, from zero, you predict the next 10 seconds or next 60 seconds, so you predict the, um, Know, first minute, and um, that prediction for all 200 stocks, then they reveal to you whatever has happened in that one minute, and you use that data, use the API again, as through the loop to do the next minute, and you do that till the ninth minute, and that model is then submitted finally in, um, by December 20th, and then they apply it to new data that emerges and give you an update every two weeks. I think, um, did you win a um, silver or something in one of the unique ones or the prior ones? I kind of sneaked in with a bronze. Like... I got like a silver in the last one. Yeah, so like this one here, I think I can sort of reuse the code that I had before. Um, so it's definitely worth worth taking a look at the previous competition and the, the winning solutions of it because I think this one here should be very similar. But as I say, this one here appears think, to be simpler. I think if I recall, let's go to since we made that comment. Okay. By the way, and since you bring that up, I think there were, yeah, here is, I think, uh, this is just maybe all previous Kaggle trading competitions, but um, but I thought I saw uh, discussion also on. So, yeah, this note. That discussion there about all previous trading competitions, I, I don't think it mentions our Ubiquant one. Oh, really? That's yeah. <laughs> Which is good, because as I say, like the Ubiquant one is practically identical to this. Oh, there it is. Oh, he did do it. I missed that one. Um, but, um, yeah. So I think I'll go back and look at uh, old Ubiquant stuff and what we did there. There was one I thought um, where the most cool, uh, they, where they actually pointed to best notebooks from prior competition. Like this. Here, but if I see it, I'll post that. Well, because that would be to Steve's comment, that would be interesting, right? To just see what uh, people have done in similar competitions, obviously. And then I also wanted to use, um, at, towards the end of the last one, there was this tab PFM, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, some kind of a tabular notebook. Yeah, in the last competition, I think I used three types of model. I used like just standard deep neural networks. Um, then there was like a 1D conv net. And as you say, like there was a tabular net network I used. So like I used all three of those. And if you look at like most of the solutions here and the solutions are doing well, they're like, yeah, like gradient boosting things. LGBM. Yeah, so there's like quite a few LGBMs in there. Mm -hmm. and like, yeah, like they're sort of very easy to understand. You're just sticking them straight in. Oh, okay. 
yeah, so there, like there's one. Then... If you were to sort the, uh, the code there by um, uh, most votes, I haven't, I haven't really got onto those ones yet, but yeah, so like at the minute, the best scores I think are people mostly just using ensembles of LGBMs. But but there's one good note about yeah, if you could sort it by by vote. Yeah, so that top one there is the one that you've just been through. Um the fourth one down, they explain the data. Yeah, I find it good. It it covers a similar thing to the one that you've just been through, but maybe makes things a bit simpler. And like just covers what every field is, and then yeah, like yeah, at the bottom I... has has a model that sort of takes the data and gives you a sort of baseline. Right, yeah, that I'd also be much better to go through next um, as well. I didn't go through it, but good. That's good maybe. Yeah, I just wanted to get a feel for the data before I into actual models so. but yeah traditional and and you know the other thing which makes it interesting is what's been the evolution of models in the tabular space since we competed like you said it's been a year so i have any good uh, baseline tabular models emerged since then that we can kind of throw in along with, you know, the traditional LDBM and convolution. That, that's going to be the interesting part. Yeah, like I know, like when we were finishing that previous competition a year ago, some people were starting to use like attention stuff. And like people were trying to use like, um, yeah, well, effectively like language model type things to predict the future. But I don't know how they've advanced since that. Yeah. So that's, you know, I also recall uh, seeing more. Yes, I That's it. Yes, it is the transformer to me. Well, but um, like the thing is, it can only handle some specific size of the data. So we need to see whether. This is interesting. There's one guy from I think there's a Kaggle Grandmaster. Uh... Oh, I I never pronounce his name right. Bohan, B O Z J A N, two B, and his last name starts with T. Um, so he's been a big proponent of like like for all the tabular data, and I I think let me see if I can find the paper that for tabular data neural networks suck. And um, um, I I you know so it's like. And, and then there's like um like a big paper comparing like a lot of data sets and so let, let me see if I can find it really quick. So it's interesting like this uh this did this get published? Oh no, this is in, as archive. Mm, I don't know, but um it was quite I don't recall when I saw this, but um Within constraints, it has some constraints that, um, you know, uh, 100 purely numerical features without missing values. So you need to make sure the values are missing and then up to 1,000 training data points. I don't know whether there are already are stuff is bigger than that, then it tends to do a better job than anything um, before. Okay. So that's 
this is just one. There have been, you know, significant progress in using deep neural networks. What you said was very true until about a year ago. And then as he was also mentioning, there has been significant progress, although I wouldn't say that in this particular tabular space that deep neural networks are not as successful is still potentially a true statement, but I'm not convinced today it's absolutely true. Mm. Um, there are, it, it made significant progress um, in the last year or two years in terms of that. And there is this ongoing, I forget the name of it now, there's an ongoing every year annual competition uh, for handling tabular data. And uh, over the last year or two, I forget the name of it. I think Yuri used to know the name of it off the top of his head. But um, uh, I'll dig it up and mention it. But the key thing is the top two entries which won it last year were deep neural networks for the first time ever. Okay. So I think uh, neural networks are beginning to make inroads in, but you know they still have some pretty severe uh, competition to um, from among non deep neural network solutions. Mm -hmm. This is one within these constraints, and in our case, all of the data points, at least this part, is true, right? Everything that we have is numerical, so that's good. Um, the question is do maybe we have more than 100 numericals? Um, but that's not true, right? It's like 17 or something, correct, Steve? Yeah, it's only, data? it's pretty small. It's like sort of somewhere between 11 and, 11 and 17. Obviously, people have started um, adding time-based features and stuff. And yeah, yeah like a yeah. few of the but, books like do feature things. But even then, it's only up to about 30 maximum. Yeah, so it definitely satisfies this guy. Right. And you can always interpolate if there are missing values. So that's no biggie. But what I don't know is whether this constraint would be satisfied. Plus 200 stocks over, um, you know, and if you have even five data points, that brings you 2,000, and we have more than five. So I think that's going to be the challenge. Oops, it's not but anyway, it's good thing to think to it. This is, this is what I was thinking of. It'll be interesting to see whether this tap DFN approach works. I'll dig into, I think as you mentioned, it might be interesting to see solutions from prior competitions. So that'd be the interesting thing to see whether anybody has discussion posts on prior competition. It was a prior October competition too. I don't remember whether we did this one. But as Steve mentioned, it would be a good thing to just kind of look through earlier. Ah, here's another interesting. Uh, as he was saying, you know, uh, there, well, I guess. So the attention was beginning to be used by Steve. That's where the transformer thing comes in. So 
This is the other thing. Is it difficult, Steve, whether you used any external data in the in any of the tabular ones that we did before? I thought in the yeah. Japanese one we did, right, somehow? The, the Japanese one we did, yeah, but the last one, uh, in the last competition, it was like this because of the fact it was just sort of normalized data and you didn't know what the stocks were and stuff. We we didn't, although they did provide, I remember, they gave you like the training data and then halfway through the competition, they updated it with a, like a supplementary set, which was like sort of more recent data that you had to append on. But I don't think there was any external thing. And I, I imagine this one here will probably be the same because of the fact that the target value is formed from like the WAP value um, and then some other sort of metric that they have. Um, I think it'd be yeah, hard maybe right. to create. Yeah, so like that's the other good thing. It's like it means that people can't go off and just find big sets of data and just have the advantage of having more data than everybody else, which has happened in other competitions. So this one here does yeah, seem so pretty contained and pretty right, small. Yeah, and also they have this index that they are using, which would probably apply to the 200 stocks or whatever that they are kind of basing it off of. And if you go off and use other data, then you might that might pull you away from. So they normalize it with this respect to this index too, right? Yeah. Okay. Anyway. That's about as far as I got in playing with the data and just kind of getting a lay of the land at this point. Great people, I'll post some of the book I was playing with just so that you don't have to search for it, but otherwise they're easily found there. Any other comments or thoughts to share, Steve? What you played with so far? Um, yeah, pretty much just what you've covered there. Yeah, so like there's there's two notebooks in the code that have been provided by the competition organizers. Um, yeah, so the basic submission demo there at the top and the one you were on before, if you just like sort them by uh, number of votes, the top two ones, they're probably like the best to, yeah, like those two, they're probably the best to get up and running. And then, as I say, I like that one, that the explain the data one. It just sort of makes it a bit clearer for me. And then, yeah, like there's yeah, quite a few notebooks. That that guy there at the top in the yellow, the Optivire baseline models, he's actually, his notebooks seem pretty good. He's got three. So like he's got ones as well where he sort of adds extra features to the data to add like more time stuff in. And yeah, like his notebooks are all pretty clean, which is good. Yeah, six yeah, and then he's got the see the bottom. Yeah, so he's got three notebooks. I haven't been through all of his stuff yet, but yeah, so there's sort of exactly two months left on it. But it's probably a good place to start because of the fact there's been a month of people producing these EDA notebooks. So. Right, right. Yeah. Notice that too. Right. Get into it. Any comments, questions, thoughts from anybody else? If not, let's dive into it and hopefully we'll have uh, more things to discuss next week. Thanks for joining, Thank everybody. Thank See you all next week. See you next week. Thanks. Bye. Bye. Bye.